Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you for uh, coming to join us at the fifth colloquium in our series on race, <coughs> equity, and justice, excuse me. I'm Bonnie Thornton Dill, Dean of the College of Arts and Humanities and professor in the renamed Harriet Tubman Department of Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies. This series, uh, as those of you who've been coming before know, is part of the college's broader campaign on race, equity, and social justice, which is addressing structural racism and creating, <clears throat> excuse me, and creating strategies to ensure equity and social justice throughout the college, the campus, and the community. Reducing discrimination in teaching, research, and service, and expanding the impact of ARHU's work, which has been long time and continuing on racism, equity, and justice through community and other partnerships. Consistent with President Pine's call to focus on race and identity as we welcome new members of our community, we are pleased to have students participating with us this morning as part of the new Terrapin Strong onboarding program. In our hue, part of our approach is to offer opportunities for you entering students to be exposed to the many different ways faculty and scholars in the college study and teach about these issues. So as part of this colloquium series, I invite faculty experts from across the college to discuss their scholarship and creative projects related to anti-racism and social justice. The format includes a mini lecture followed by a conversation with me and then an opportunity for you to ask questions. We will be keeping our, your microphones muted for the talk and during the uh, last 20 minutes, you will be invited to submit questions through the chat, which is moderated by Associate Dean Linda Aldery. So please note um, this event is being recorded for future viewing on our Hughes website. So today's session features Dr. Tamanika Ferguson, a University of Maryland presidential postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Communication. The fellowship program uh, that she is part of brings scholars to campus who are invested in equity and inclusion and whose research contributes to social justice. This is Dr. Ferguson's second year of the two-year program. Dr. Ferguson's areas of, areas of specialization uh, are media by and about incarcerated women and their feminist allies. She earned a doctorate in communication, culture, and media studies with a joint certificate in women's studies from Howard University. And she is currently working on her book manuscript entitled, Coming From the Inside. That's not the title. I don't think I got that title. Voices from the Inside. Voices from the Inside. <laughs> uh, Voices from the Inside, Women in Prison Speak, um, that examines incarcerated women's advocacy and media activism. So without further ado, let me turn the uh, mic over to Dr. Tamanika Ferguson. Uh, thank you, Dean Thornton Dill, for the gracious invitation. And also uh, to everyone for taking time out of your busy morning uh, to be here. Thank you. So I prepared several slides that I'm going to be sharing with you during my uh, mini presentation. I'm going to start by reading a short statement by an incarcerated woman as a starting point um, into my presentation. Share the screen with you. Okay. One second. Okay. Prisons are, after all, just a reflection and concentration of what is wrong in the whole of society. Writing is a way of communicating about the social environment and what prisoners feels needs to be changed. Certainly, racism as experienced in prison is also a reality outside. Abuse that women prisoners experience started for most 
before they were incarcerated. A deep reflection into one's own life can result in a deeper understanding of the world at large. Those in prison have ideas of what to change and how to go about it that go far beyond prison walls. Where's my PowerPoint? Sorry about that. This statement captures an important point about writing. Let me get to the next screen. About writing as, um, so this statement captured an important point uh, about writing. Uh, writing is an expression of women's communicative action and their resistance. For example, for centuries, women across the globe have, in literature, academics, and politics, have used the power of the pen to challenge dominant forms of ideological and cultural practices. Similarly, empowered women in California use writing as a strategy for resisting uh, the system of incarceration. These empowered women uh, use media to talk about their pathways to prison, uh, their prison experiences within an oppressive environment, their resistance to uh, surveillance, control, punishment, and also their advocacy for uh, human rights and liberation. Their stories provide insight into the social and legal practices that criminalize and incarcerate women from poor Black, Latinx, and undocumented Indigenous and LBGTQ communities. So in the, so right now I'm actually in the process of um, working on my book manuscript, which is an outgrowth of my dissertation. So in the initial study, I focused on the perspectives and actions that shape the incarcerated women's voice and agency. I used a critical feminist approach to examine gender, power, and oppression within the prison context and the emancipatory potential of incarcerated women's advocacy and activism. So in my analysis uh, of women's discourse, I focused on the constraints imposed on them in connection with their gender, race, sexuality, class, and their imprisoned status. I focused on you know, what fueled their individual and collective agency to confront those, to confront those constraints. Uh, I looked at the different strategies of resistance that women in pr uh, prison take up in their activism and also their gendered and the gendered and political nature of women's advocacy. So for example, some women um, believe that they have the power within to tr transform their own circumstances. That is by how they perceive and relate to their prison experiences. So for example, as one incarcerated woman explains, it takes a strong individual to endure, overcome and thrive while inside the belly of the beast. We each resist in our own ways. We're choosing to be healthy, sober, functional. We don't give our power to the system. We don't medicate or give up. We see the glass half full of hope. So by focusing on the um, ideas and arguments that women expressed in their statements, I uncovered the most pressing issues that need to be addressed. For example, this is a um, statement by an elderly woman advocating for the end of life without parole. 
She wrote, listen, hear the words of a 79 year old woman who has been in prison for 38 years on life without parole. Life without parole is a slow death sentence. It eats away hope for the people inside and for their families. It is not justice. Let me see here. So the process of studying um, incarcerated women's published statements and essays and newsletters and academic books and journals led to my formulation of the incarcerated women's public sphere. The incarcerated women's public sphere is a communicative space where women enact and disseminate their, re, um, their, advocate, their advocacy and their resistance. It is an outgrowth of, or the outcome of women's media activism, which offers uh, the agency necessary for them to use their uh, written voices to advance their personal and political aspirations. So, my book project, um, Voices from the Inside, Incarcerated Women Speak, expands and enlarges a dissertation study by uh, grounding feminist theories of voice in media with social theories of voice and counter public sphere theories and critical race theories. It also digs deeper into the intentions, goals, and motivations of women's media activism. I am preparing to conduct uh, in-depth interviews with members of the California Coalition for Women Prisoners to learn from you know, their reflections, their expertise, and their work. They work directly with incarcerated women in California. Um, this organization has been on the front lines of giving voice and visibility to incarcerated women and their advocacy for the past 25 years, particularly through its newsletter publication, The Fire Inside, but also you know, through its um, education, legal, and political work. So these activists you know, can speak to the challenges uh, that women face in organizing in prison that is not revealed in the writings, right? Um, these activists can also um, speak on what the organization itself is doing uh, to improve the lives of incarcerated women, but also what this organization is doing to uh, change the system of incarceration. So that's, that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Tamanika. Just as you started speaking, they put on some loud thing outside my window. So I had to oh, it's okay. take okay. a minute to get this. So um, thank you for this. This is uh, interesting. And of course it raises a number of questions that I'd love to ask you. And, and the first one really is um, at the end, do you talk about incarcerated women's public sphere, which mm -hmm. in some ways almost sounds like um, an oxymoron uh, because they're incarcerated and yet they have a public sphere. Um, mm -hmm. So I wondered if you talk a little bit more about that and talk about as I was listening to you, I didn't know if the California coalition became the thing that helped make it a public sphere or how are you thinking about that? Tell us a little bit more. So the, okay. Um, the California Coalition for Women Prisoners was um, co-created with um, incarcerated black women back in 1995 to address the, um, to politicize a lawsuit against the uh, California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation in the state of California for the inhumane um, healthcare system. So that's how that started. And then the organization decided to 
um, create a newsletter publication that would, you know, enable incarcerated women to um, share their stories, talk about their issues, to give their perspectives, right? So that's how that started. And that was 25 years ago. So in a way, actually incarcerated women provide activists on the outside or activists with this organization um, in terms of its issues, the direction that the organization should go in to address these issues. So you see in this newsletter over 25 years, this newsletter, um, have the voices of incarcerated. So incarcerated women are speaking through this newsletter. They're addressing topics related to their incarceration. They're addressing topics that led to their incarceration. They, um, they're sharing their, their personal, their fears. They're, they're talking about what they're doing to change the system. Um, so the voices are multiple, but they're all pretty much advocating for the same thing, human rights, liberation. So I decided to study um, and examine the newsletters over a 25 year period, looking at their, um, their statements, their essays, their writings on the prison ex their prison experiences and what they were saying. And I just dug deeper and deeper and that led, you know, that led to my um, formulation that, you know, even though this group is incarcerated in, you know, prison, there's this notion that women should adhere to, you know, um, surveillance and control, but women are pushing back. So it's, it's contested. Women are pushing back against the system. And this is one way that they're doing it through their media activism. So, um, is this yeah, so a, go, go ahead. on, I'm sorry. So yeah, it's the, 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 the newsletters. So this platform has given them this, you know, this voice mm -hmm. has given them the ability to, you know, have their voices circulated through this organization and the organization's allies. Mm -hmm. So it's the organization has, you know, provided the platform. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Is this organization kind of, I know this is the organization you're studying, but I'm wondering, is it a one of a kind thing? Are there other kinds of uh, mm -hmm. places that you know of across the country where um, incarcerated women are using uh, writing uh, as a form of uh, advocacy and resistance? Historically, there, yes, historically there has been, um, that's a good question. But throughout time, uh, we're seeing we're seeing fewer and fewer situations where um, women are doing the type of stuff that women in California are doing with this organization. So yes, there has been, but it's dwindled down. So so what makes this um, this case study unique is because um, women in California have this platform through this organization. Now, you know, there may be, I mean, some out there, um, but not to my knowledge, not, you know, over the years that I've done, you know, the study on this, um, I, like I said, I can say in the past, yes, but today, no. And of course that is, that is a problem. That is a problem because, you know, women are incarcerated throughout the United States. So it's not just women in California. Um, but I will say that there are plenty of um, academic book projects that have um, incorporated writings, you know, essays from incarcerated women, and I study those too. But you know that, of course, that's that's not like an organization that has provided consistent, you know, consistent um, visibility, you know, to incarcerated women over a 25-year period, and so that's what makes this, you know, organization. Um, or this case study unique. So as you were working on this and looking at what the women said, what surprised you most? What surprised me most about what mm -hmm. they said? What um, they said, mm -hmm. oh, uh, The um, 
just the stuff they go through on a daily basis. Um, it's heartbreaking. Uh, the challenges, the struggles, you know, that they deal with, the inhumane ways that they're treated you know, by correctional officers, you know, by the administration. Mm -hmm. um, it's like they just, you know, feel like they're thrown away like trash. And so they're, you know, reading those statements over the years, it's, uh, it's mind boggling. Mm -hmm. It is. But, you know, um, so there that, there's that. And then on the other side, there's hope. There's this light that um, women are not just taking this laying down and they're not just waiting for people to, um, change their circumstances, you know? So uh, there's there's two sides. There's the, oh my God, this is, you know, this these are the things that people need to know about that's going on in the prisons. Yeah. So I have a lot of questions. <laughs> um, and, and, and one of them is, you know, I think a lot of times people feel um, that once people are in prison, uh, they're kind of out of view, out of sight, out of mind, um, and don't think about them very much, although we're having a lot more kind of prison activism in, in the culture right now. But I guess the question is, you say people need to know this, and the question is, from your perspective, why do people need to know it? Why should people care about people who have been uh, shut inside these prisons. Um, and I just, I just would like to hear your response to that. Well, I think first and foremost, it's the issue of um, how we perceive those that are incarcerated. Um, the category criminal um, comes to mind it's an identity that's constructed around, you know, around the criminal, the criminal criminality that's been imposed on women. Um, it's an identity that we as a society have, you know, this is how we see women, right? Um, bad women, criminals, bad wives, bad mothers who should be locked away. So if we, so it's easy to throw them away like trash mm -hmm. and not think about them once they're locked behind these, you know, concrete walls. Mm -hmm. Oh, they're criminals. They're bad people. They don't, mm -hmm. they don't belong out here. Right. And so, um, that's a problem in the whole of society that, so when I say that this is something that everybody needs to be aware of, it's all of us, you know, we have to remember that they are humans deserving of better treatment. Um, but also we need to really start thinking about how we address social problems in this society and locking people up. It, that's just not, that's not the solution. And until we could see them as human beings, we will continue to shunt them from society, pretend they don't exist, that their problems don't exist, that what they're going through in prison, uh, you know, you know, that that's not our problem. We, we have to get beyond that. And we will not, um, people will not fight for incarcerated women or even be concerned about what they're going through until we can, we can get over our own biases, mm -hmm. you one know, the, and how we categorize criminal. Mm -hmm. One of the things I thought of in relationship to that into, um, was that, yes, they may be shut behind these gates, fences, walls, uh, whatever. Mm -hmm. But they still have a lot of connections in the community outside the walls. And so there's a way in which they are um, physically shut off, but they are still contributing in some, they are still part of the community. Um, uh, through their children and their families and their uh, loved ones and whatever kinds of connections that they have. And their experiences is sh are shaping the experiences of those people outside. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so that was, you know, one of the things I thought about that we forget that they have these kinds of connections and what that means. I don't know if yes. you want to say anything about that. 
Yes. I mean, and if it wasn't for, you know, um, families out there on the front lines campaigning, if it wasn't for groups like, you know, um, the California Coalition for Women Prisoners, you know, if it wasn't for, you know, the children or the adult tr children of incarcerated women, then um, we wouldn't be seeing this type of, well, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't say we would be seeing this type of activism, but th these type of issues would not be at the forefront. It would not be out there. And people are, you're right. Um, there's a lot of activism going on um, to support, to support incarcerated women. Yeah, there is. Are there, are you seeing any kind of policy outcomes or policy changes in relationship to um, either the activism that's taking place in California or some of the other kinds of activism that's coming from the inside out? So over the course, you know, of examining this newsletter, there definitely has been some, some small changes, most definitely. Um, I can't think of that at the top of my head, but there, there has been, I have, I have seen, you know, um, some changes, you know, things that, you know, that, that were talked about, you know, five or 10 years ago. Um, I think one, okay, for an example, uh, women were required to pay a copay to go see, you know, the, the, the nurse or the doctor in prison. And that was putting a financial burden on people who already are struggling. You know, you have poor people in prison. So now you're requiring them to pay to go see a nurse who she may only get an aspirin. So after, you know, fighting that, there's no longer copay. So it's like little things like that, where I wouldn't say little, but big things like that, that has definitely changed. But I would say that, um, oh, there is another big change in terms of prison housing, um, prisoners who ad identify as trans women. Mm -hmm. So, a lot of things around identity is definitely changing um, in the California in the California prisons, and I know that you know once I have an, a chance to um, interview activists, they will definitely be able to speak to a lot of the policy changes um, that they've been able to to move and shift, you know, to incarcerated women's advantage. Yeah. Um. So, Tamanika. We were talking about people on the outside kind of ignoring these issues in many ways. What brought you to these, to study these issues? Why, what, what is your interest in them? What, what attracted you to this as a topic to understand and not just understand, I mean, I assume that you're doing it also because you, of your own desire to do some advocacy around or make a, a, people aware of these issues. Well, so there's there's the personal level, then there of course there's the academic level mm -hmm. level. But in terms of personal, um, so you know I was born and raised in a community in Los Angeles that was deeply impacted, you know, by the crack epidemic, gang violence, the carceral mm -hmm. state, you know. And so uh, by the age of 14, I was incarcerated in juvenile hall. I had my daughter at 15, so I became a teenage mother. I didn't graduate from high school and, you know, incarceration has been a constant and revolving door for members of my family, both male and female, you know, caught up in the criminal justice systems in California. So my, my lived experiences growing up in uh, LA um, has influenced my interest in uh, addressing the deeper issues, the deeper social issues in society. So it, all throughout undergrad and grad school, um, I was you know, interested in understanding uh, gender, race, and class relations in American society. But you know, it was when I got to Howard, right? That you know, where I received the uh, critical intellectual guidance that you know, allowed me to contextualize all that I had you know, seen, observed, and gone through in my, you know, throughout my life, 
Um, and, you know, also, you know, it, it deeply influenced my feminist awakening and interest in critical uh, race and gender theories in the context of women's incarceration. So it was, you know, during my doctoral program where I decided um, I wanted to focus on the activist side of it, not, you know, the, 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 the causes of, you know, crime and incarceration, but um, I wanted to look at, okay, women's agency, what, what are they doing to um, fight the system, to improve their own lives, you know, to, to, to transform. And so those programs were aligned um, with my political investments and feminist struggles, you know, for liberation. So that's pretty much, you know, how I came uh, to, to this work, yeah. And, and how has your postdoctoral experience, I'm sure, um, helped you kind of move from the mm -hmm. doctoral work and the dissertation work and, and even helped reshape in some ways or expand, maybe reshape is too strong a word, your own mm -hmm. thinking about this issue? What has this experience provided you? To be honest with you, it has provided me with the space and time to think, to reflect, to work through the gaps of my dissertation, to put things together, to see things more crystal clear. That's pretty much what the postdoc has done for me. So I mm -hmm. appreciate it so much. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, well. Um, just thinking through, I mean, it, it, it's, oh, it's a process, as you all know. But um, yeah, I just thinking through it, reflecting on it, um, reading, you know, expanding the literature. And mm -hmm. of course, that's allowed me to rethink a lot, you know, with this, with this research. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's what the postdoc has done for me. <laughs> well, I ask that because, you know, we do have some undergraduates on, we have people in different um, stages. And at sometimes, you know, we've talked to people who have been working on this project for, you know, 20 years and they're talking about it. And then people who are, <laughs> well, maybe you won't be working on this project for 20 years, but in any case, just, uh, just, just the, the, the kind of, I guess, to have people kind of be aware of the ways in which time and circumstances kind of change your perspective, expand um, your perspective and your work. And so that's really um, why I wanted to speak to that. So I have a couple more questions and then I, I'm gonna open it up and I see people are beginning to uh, put some things uh, in the chat. Do you mind, um, Dean, do you mind if I just go back? And I just wanna make one more point about the postdoc. Um, so yes, yeah, so the, the time and the space to uh, reflect, to read, to really just dig deep into the material, mm -hmm. but also uh, being able to conversate with other scholars at different levels, right? Um, about their work or about my work. And a lot of times those are some really good conversations mm -hmm. because they, those conversations actually help me with my own my own research and writing. So I would say that um, the postdoc has really helped in that way too, you know, for those, you know, uh, grad students who may be thinking about, about the postdoc. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about, you know, digging deep into the literature, but it's also networking and uh, just finding time to conversate with, with uh, faculty across, you know, disciplines and at different mm -hmm. levels mm -hmm. will, will definitely be helpful, yeah. So yeah. um, writing is their means of um, activism, is a means of resistance, as you talk about it. Um, mm -hmm. Is writing something that people continue to do? Do people get into writing because there's been somebody doing a writing course or they're just writers, kind of, um, that that's mm. a, a form of expression? Do you have a sense of that yet um, and, on whether or not they continue to write or... Um, when they leave prison? So, okay. That's a lot of questions. So take um, anything, any, any piece of it that works for you. So of course there, you know, the, the so for, for the women that I study, the writings I study in the newsletter, 
their self-talk. Uh, there's, I mean, there are um, scholars or academics who go into the prison to teach writing workshops and things of that nature. But for the, the, um, the writers that I study in the newsletter, uh, they write to the newsletter. Mm -hmm. They write to um, tell their stories, mm -hmm. to get their advocacy out. Mm -hmm. Not so much, you know, I'm taking a class and then I'm gonna write for this, news, this newsletter. Mm -hmm. It's not that kind of format. That's, that's what I got, you know, from studying this uh, newsletter over a 25 year period. Mm -hmm. So it's, and, and then some write more than others you know, one incarcerated mm -hmm. woman, she may write once and you'll never mm -hmm. see her name again. Mm -hmm. But others, they're writing constantly. They're contributing mm -hmm. their voices to this newsletter consistently. Mm -hmm. And um, once they are released, you know, they get out. There's been a lot of uh, actually formerly incarcerated women who also contribute to the newsletter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So, they're, so they're actually involved with the organization. Mm -hmm. So they don't just get released and just going about their way. They're still involved with the organization. Mm -hmm. They're actually, you know, they're, they're giving back. So mm -hmm. just because they've been released, they're still giving back to the women on the inside. They're still fighting for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Great. So I'm going to um, let Linda, I see their questions beginning to come into the chat. So I'm going to let Linda move to those right now, Linda. Thank you, and thank you, Tamanika, for your presentation. Um, <clears throat> this, uh, this first comment is not a question, but I think there's a question in it. It says, so glad for your work. My small experience in two county prisons and help from mentors tells me that arts programming is much more likely to be directed at men. I think the question in there is, um, is do you feel this is true? Are there programs? that you feel are mostly for men rather than women? Are we talking about in the university or are we talking about in prison? I believe that the question is related to in prison. Oh yeah, you, you know, you're talking about rehabilitation programs. Um, it's a sad thing, particularly in California. Uh, incarcerated women are expected to rehabilitate themselves and the money for programming it's not there. That's a continuous fight. They've been fighting for the past 25 years for better rehabilitative programs. That is a big issue. Yes, men, and unfortunately in uh, male prisons, uh, they tend to have uh, more programs readily available to them. Mm, wonder why, no. <laughs> yeah, well, that was no, the next yeah. question, right? <laughs> yeah, yes, that is a problem though. Yeah, yep. Thank you. Uh, the next one, you speak of the media presence of these women. Do they have access to social media or just the newsletter to express themselves? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, so I'm talking about state um, prisons for women in California. There, I mean, legally, there's no access to social media. Only in federal, federal prisons, you have access to internet and all of that. Um, but in state prisons, not legally. So the uh, newsletters is, is sort of like a low level um, media outlet. You know, if you could just imagine what it would be like if incarcerated women had access to, you know, social media platforms like Twitter. I mean, that would be a whole, that would take, you know, their, their activism to a whole nother level. That may be, you know, an, another book project I can think about. <laughs> but yeah, no, no access to social media in the state prisons. Thank you. The next question is uh, relating to popular culture. <clears throat> what say you about the success of Orange is the New Black in popular culture and how are they doing in telling the stories of incarcerated women? So I'm going to admit that uh, I have not really watched Orange is the New Black, maybe like when it first came out. Uh, it's a maybe this is just my own bias, but I felt that it was a, this glamorized depiction of uh, women go through on the inside. I, I didn't feel it was an, ac an accurate depiction. So I really, I really can't speak to um, Orange is the New Black. 
Um, and I think it has a lot to do with the fact that um, just my own personal experience, even though I was a juvenile, but you know, just knowing about the, the system and then reading you know, the statements of women themselves, I, I was turned off by you know, that popular, because it's popular, it's there to glamorize and you know, to get viewers to watch it. And no, and I'm pretty sure if you were to ask you know, the incarcerated women who I've been studying, they will say, no, this is not an actual you know, accurate uh, re uh, representation of what I've experienced in prison on a daily, yeah. Going back to the newsletter then, questions here. Where does the newsletter get posted? Is it in the digital world? Also, is it vetted or, i.e. censored by the prison administrators? Okay, so good question. Um, it is archived on the, the organization's website. It's publicly accessible. The organization is, uh, uh, trying to get a grant so that way they can actually um, have it to where people can just Google and come up with, you know, with, with the newsletter that way. Yes, I mean, so writing is a constitutional right in prison, but there is a lot of issues with censorship. So the newsletter does get um, circulated in the prison. Other, other, other incarcerated people read it in prison. I'm not going to say that everyone is reading it, but yes. Um, and there is definitely censorship so that, of course, that's, that's the struggle too with, you know, the administration saying, no, you can't, you can't write this stuff. We're not going to have it. We're going to censor your mail. That is a problem. Um, and uh, the, the women's prisons in, in, in California, and those are some of the things that they struggle with, you know, and, but also this newsletter, um, because it's available on the website and because the organization is connected to other support groups, to parents, to children, it's 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 out there. So people are reading it. It's not on the le level, of course, of of social media, um, which you know you can disseminate quickly and people are going to read it. But you know, it's 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 getting out there. So they are definitely get, getting some visibility. Yeah. The next question: Do you have a female family member or a close female friend who is or has been incarcerated that also inspired you to write your book? Yes. So, um, as I mentioned, I was um, incarcerated in Los Padrinos Juvenile Hall in Norwalk, California, when I was um, fourteen. And uh, I have two aunties: one on my father's side, one on my mother's side, who did several stints in the pen. Pen meaning the penitentiary. And um, I had an older cousin who did a couple of years um, at CIW in uh, Corona, California. So yeah, I've, this is, this is how I came to my work. Yes. Thank yeah. you. Uh -huh. Are you looking to incorporate current events, namely calls for abolition of police and prison and COVID's threat on prisons, close living quarters into your book? And if so, yes. to what extent? There's a second question to that, but I'll wait and see if you want to answer first about the current events question. Yes. Um, well, I mean, yes. So as you can imagine, uh, the pandemic, you know, has exacerbated, you know, the in inhumane conditions that women are already exposed to on a daily. Overcrowding, of course, um, sanitary issues. Um, and yes, it is impacting communications and media activism. Um, for example, the last newsletter, the voices of incarcerated women uh, were pretty much non-existent. There were a few, you know, who did talk about the lack of uh, accountability and concern for women's health and safety. So yes, as I um, write the book, as I think through, I will, you know, talk about the impact of the coronavirus um, on their lives, but also on their media activism. And there was a, another question about abolition, I, I think you said. Um, was other current events such as calls for abolition oh. of police and prisons. Yes, um, so, I mean, my, my project starts from the proposition that, you know, incarcerated women's voice matters, their perspective matters, and their lives matter, you know. Um, and yes, you know, it shows that the same law and order uh, justifications for 
you know, policing and killing, you know, black women and men, you know, extend into the carceral state, you know, where women are routinely subjected to abuse, violence, and discrimination. And so um, I think the overall project, well, the overall project, you know, it responds to the urgent call for more transformative uh, social action that centers um, human dignity-based justice and, al and, and alternative ways of thinking about and addressing, you know, social problems that do not involve the carceral state. So yeah, my book definitely uh, gets to that, yes. The second related question, have currently incarcerated women you are working with or their families commented on these? So you've already mentioned, I think, a couple of comments, but have there been any other um, quotes or interview findings that relate to the current events that we listed? I'm sorry. You say that, I'm sorry, can you um, repeat that? So I think the person is just is asking if uh, the women that you're working with, if they have made particular comments about the current events. Such oh, as okay, okay. Um, so the newsletters have slowed down. So I'm not sure just yet because I think the last newsletter was like in the summer and the, the voices of incarcerated women were really not were really not existent, but the few that were speaking on it, yes, they were talking about the corona, they were talking about, you know, the killings, our lives matter. So yes, it is there, but I'm pretty sure in the next few newsletters, they'll be talking more about. So the newsletters really is also a reflection of what's going on in society at the current moment. That's the one good thing about the newsletters. The newsletters does not just talk about what's going on in prison. It actually makes that connection between um, you know, the system of incarceration and, you know, uh, what's going on out here in society. So that's the good thing about the newsletter. It does both. Yeah. What do you hope to get from the interviews when this is all, when everything is done? Well, I really think that, you know, the interviews can speak to you know, um, incarcerated women's, you know, personal and political aspirations, they, they, can, they can go deeper than what I can get from the writings themselves, right? They can talk about, you know, their struggles to prison organizing, you know, because I mean, there are a lot of obstacles that they face. Let's, let's be honest about that. It's not like uh, incarcerated men, you know, who have a history of, of activism um, and confronting the prison system, right? And so, these activists can get at the challenges, can get at, you know, what are the goals and intentions and motivations behind incarcerated women's writings? Um, you know, what is the organization doing to improve the lives? What kind of policies has it, has it changed? Those kind of things, just, just digging deeper into the um, in, intention and broader goals of the organization for incarcerated women, yeah. Thank you. Um, have you looked into women on death row? So women on death row, they write to the newsletter. So it's the, the newsletters, the voices in the newsletters reflect women at different levels. Women who may be doing a few years, those who have, may have done 20 years, those on death row, those who you know have been sentenced to life without parole, they're, they're different, um, different statuses that emerge in the, in the writings. So yeah, death row is, death row is a, it, it's, it's a, they call it a, a, it's, I mean, it's a death sentence. So yes, there are those who talk about um, abolishing uh, life without parole and, and death row. Yeah. This yes, may I'm, be a good oh. question to end. Oh, sorry. No, 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 sorry. go on, go on. I was gonna say one last question, which may be a good one to end on. What impact do you hope to make with your work? What future projects do you have in store? What future projects? <laughs> uh, I actually would like to use um, 
partic participatory research method um, in my next project. I would I would like to work with the National Council for formerly um, incarcerated for incarcerated and formerly incarcerated women. I have not thought through on what I would like to do with this um, organization, but the organization um, supports um, incarcerated women and formerly incarcerated women. So reentry is another area where, you know, women are released, they're released from prison, but the support is not really, the, the infrastructure is not really set up for them to succeed. It's like it's set up for them to fail. So that's why we have recidiv recidivism. So I would like to um, do some work around reentry um, in education and how we can wrap education into reentry re services to help, you know, um, women rebuild their, you know, their lives as they navigate the social world. So that's something I've been, I've been thinking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bonnie, I can turn it over to you. Oh, okay. I saw one more question. I didn't know if you were going to go to um, it or not. Happy, I can ask it. I think we have time. Okay. Um, defund the police has had, defunding the police has had various responses. Some in low income communities have reported that the action would negatively impact many of the racial ethnic poor communities. How do you think this would impact arrests and structural racism of police practices in poor communities? If we were to defund the police, is that what is that is that the question? I'm sorry. Yes, that came from the source of the question. So yes. <laughs> so, the, okay, I'm hearing if we defund the police in poor communities of color, would that impact arrest rates? Yes, and structural racism of police practices. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, uh, yes, indeed. And but with that, we also need to have in place um, alternative ways of of addressing those social problems. So you, you talk about defining the police even in poor communities of color. Yes, a rate arrest rates will go down. Um, does that mean that we'll, we won't have violence in communities? Yes, but we. An abolitionist framework is um, is looking at the circumstances, thinking about coming up with solutions to solve these problems. You know that doesn't involve the police state, right? We're talking about alternative solutions to dealing with communities that are already in shambles. So, bringing you know, and and I can talk about my own experiences growing up in LA. Um, the police were very brutal. They so. The issue with police in the community, there was a total disconnect there. There was no respect for the people in the community. And they were really good at taking you around the corner and whooping your ASS without any remorse. Yes. And so um, the bad police make good police look bad. They do. And we have a lot of bad apples in law, in law enforcement. So yes, um, using an abolitionist lens is looking at dealing with our own problems within the community without having um, police presence. And that's going to take some work. Yeah. Another strategy, another way, you know, another vision of, of rebuilding the communities that we want to see. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> Well, I, I think it's clearly um, a question I'm looking at the time for a whole nother conversation. Yes, uh, yes. Because I think there are lots of uh, issues that are raised there. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we're also uh, coming to an end. Um, so Tamanika, I really want to thank you. I think this has really been um, uh, a fascinating conversation. And I really appreciate the fact that you have chosen to um, kind of highlight the, um, the activism and the resistance of uh, women in prison. Because as you said earlier, we have lots of, we could all probably, you know, think of writings um, about men's resistance in prison, you know, Soledad, I mean, go back a long way. Yeah. 
there's a lot of that. And yes. there's really not much that we know yes. or see or that's said about women. So I think this is an important mm -hmm. contribution to our understanding of um, uh, women and what happens to them in um, these kinds of totalizing uh, institutions and the way they are seen in society and also the, the impact it has on their families and communities. So um, thank yes. you for your work and, and for your uh, decision to turn your own experience into something that would be productive and um, helpful and informative to the rest of us. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We have one more of these, and we'll look forward to seeing you then. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>